12, beginning at verse 38. Then some of the Pharisees and teachers of the law said to him, <clears throat> Teacher, we want to see a sign from you. He answered, A wicked and adulterous generation asks for a sign, but none will be given it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of a huge fish, so the Son of Man will be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The men of Nineveh will stand up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it, for they repented at the preaching of Jonah. And now something greater than Jonah is here. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you very much, Tricia. Now, one of the perks of being a vicar is that uh, every now and then funeral directors send you merchandise, is the only word I can use to describe it, little bits and pieces to persuade you to recommend them to people who need to use their services. I've had mugs from them during COVID. We got a lovely pack of uh, face protectors. What were they called again? Face masks, whatever they were, and hand sanitizer. This year, probably my favorite yet, the funeral directors, I can't remember their name now. That's terrible. That's why they sent this to me. But they sent me one of these desk calendars where you tear off each day. And each day, I just tore off all the ones from last week when we were on holiday. Each day, it gives you some sort of... Um, Words to inspire you for the day ahead. Deliver your words, not by number, but by weight. That's good advice to a preacher. And um, it also tells you what happened on that day. So in 1748, on the 1st of April, the ruins of Pompeii were discovered. On Tuesday, the 2nd of April, the first official panda crossing was opened. On the Wednesday, the 3rd of April in 1913, Emmeline Pankhurst was sentenced to three years in jail. So uh, as I've gone through this year, I've enjoyed tearing off my desk calendar and discovering a new fact and being inspired, an army of lions commanded by a deer will never be an army of lions. Things like that to get you through the day. Now, why have I started with that? Well, what we're thinking about in our all-age service today is a particular day in the church's year, which we've already had, but rushed past it, and you may not have thought about it. So I've done my best to reproduce a sort of desk calendar. Here we go. These are for the three days of Good Friday and Saturday in between, and Easter Sunday. And now, we had services, didn't we, on Good Friday and Easter Sunday, so we know what those are about. But what's going on with this Saturday in the middle? It's really interesting. People don't even know what to call it. Some people call it Easter Saturday, but people who know about these things get very angry when you call it Easter Saturday because it's before Easter Sunday. And so Easter hasn't started yet. So some people call it Holy Saturday or just Saturday. Now... The thing about Easter, whatever, I just called it Easter Saturday, Holy Saturday, let's call it that, is we don't really know what was going on, do we? So here on Good Friday, we remember, of obviously, Jesus dying on the cross, and then Jesus being buried and sent into the tomb and laid in the tomb. And then on Easter Sunday, go all the way over here, we celebrate him coming out of the tomb, and it's joyful. <coughs> The question is, what's going on in between? Is it a sort of flat line where Jesus is just lying there, dead and buried? Is there something else going on? Well, you know, of course, if you've been here for a, a while, that on these all-age services, the first of the month, we're going through the Apostles' Creed. And this is where we've got to, these two lines at the bottom. He descended to the dead on the third day, he rose again. And again, you could say, well, that's just Good Friday and Easter Sunday. He descended the dead. On the third day, he rose again. So why do we have a break in the middle? Why are we waiting around on that Saturday in between? If we had a desk calendar, what would we write on it about what happened on that day all the way back sometime in the 30s AD? Well, actually, I think our creed helps us. 
And the, the creed, when we read it in the light of that reading and the second one we'll come to, help us to understand why this day in the middle is just so special. But to really make sense of it, we have to think a little bit about how people in Jesus' day thought about the world and about, if you like, the geography of it all. So, you know, if I say to you, what's up there, beyond the roof, somewhere up there, we'll get to, it's the sky, isn't it? But the sky really is just air, and you might get to some clouds. If you go higher and higher and higher, eventually you'll get to space, right? I think that's more or less right. And if I go down from here, I'll go through the foundations of the church, through any dead bodies buried under there, go deeper and deeper and deeper. Eventually I'll get to the centre of the earth, and if I keep going, I'll go out the other side again. And that's how we know that's the way the world is. Back in the time of Jesus and the time that the Bible is written, people generally thought about the way the world was in a slightly different way. And here is a very rough picture of how people thought the world was. So here, if you like, is the earth. This is the pl a place where we live. Above it, right at the top, heaven, the place where God lives. And then all these other things, you have these waters, you have this so the sky thing, where the sun, the moon, the stars are, you have waters which are around and then below the earth, and you have this place called the underworld. Now that doesn't look anything like how we think the world is. But all the way through the Bible, that's the sort of picture of the world that the writers of the Bible are kind of interacting with. And the big thing, the big thing to think about and to notice is basically there are, there are three big layers. There's heaven at the top, where God lives. There's the earth, where human beings who are alive live. And there's under the earth, this place, the underworld, where people who have died go to. Now, there's a lot more we could say about that, and that raises all kinds of questions, doesn't it? If that's how people thought about the world, how does it relate to how we think about the world today? And the, the big thing to say is that even back then, when people thought about the world, they kind of knew that this was a sort of picture that didn't really map onto how the world really is. In the Old Testament, the various people talk about, well, God doesn't actually live up there somewhere, because God is beyond all our understanding. It was like a sort of picture to help them think about how they as humans related to the rest of the world around them. You think about, we, even, we, we carry on doing that today. Apparently, I only did chemistry up to GCSE, but apparently, like the first day of, of A-level chemistry, they tell you everything you learned at GCSE chemistry is not quite what you think it is. And all the sort of ways that you learned to, to make sense of little things, you sort of tear them up and start over. It's not that you, my chemistry teachers at GCSE were lying to me, they were making it a bit more simple because I wasn't ready and I never was ready to understand the complicated stuff which all the A-level students. And I imagine if you go on, you get to, to university and people say, actually, that isn't quite that simple. We have to tear it up and start over. Imagine trying to understand God and how his world works and how he relates to everything. This was a way that people thought about the world. But even in the Bible, we see them saying, we know it's not really this simple. But it helps us understand what God is like and helps us understand what, where humans fit into God's plans and purposes. Even apart from things like chemistry, we still do that sort of thing, don't we? You see a footballer score a goal, and one of the things they often do is point upwards, no doubt thinking about a loved one, maybe a grandfather or someone who got them into the game who's now dead. But they want to remember them. Now, if you ask that football, they say, you don't really think that grandpa is up there. Say, well, no, not really. But it's how we, th how we today would think about people who die. They go up somewhere. In Jesus' day, in the day of the Bible, they thought they'd go down to this place, the underworld. So you have these three levels. But here's the thing to understand. What happens, what the Bible talks about happening, between Good Friday and Easter Sunday. We know Jesus' body goes into the tomb. But the Bible writers say that Jesus' soul goes down to this underworld place 
In other words, he goes to where all the people who had died before him went. That's what he means in Matthew chapter 12 and verse 40. Did you see it there? It's page 978 in the Bibles. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of a huge fish, so the Son of Man will be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. It's this idea here, the heart of the earth. He's not like going to the center of the earth in some adventure. He's going to the place where dead people go, where people in Jesus, they thought dead people went after they had died. You see, what's going on in Matthew chapter 12 is that that the Pharisees don't quite believe that Jesus is something special. They want some proof, some evidence that he's really someone who they should follow. And Jesus' evidence is, I'm going to be killed, and I'm going to go, I'm going to die a proper death, like everyone you've always known has died. And then after that, I'm going to come back to life again. I'm not going to give you another sign. That's the sign that you should follow me, that you should believe in me. So Jesus is saying here, he is going to go to the place where people who die go. Now, I don't think he's thinking in terms of that sort of place down there somewhere. He's using the picture that they all would have understood. When people die, this is where they go. C.S. Lewis, who thought deeply about life and death and what goes beyond, put it like this. One may think of a diver, first reducing himself to nakedness, then glancing midair, then gone with a splash, vanished, rushing down through green and warm water, into black and cold water, down through increasing pressure, into the death-like region of ooze and slime and old decay, then up again, back to colour and light, his lungs almost bursting, till suddenly he breaks surface again, holding in his hand the dripping, precious thing that he went down to recover. Easter Saturday, if you like, is the moment where he does, Jesus doesn't just sort of lie flat. Easter Saturday is when Jesus goes down and then starts to come back up again. It's the moment where he experiences death, like all of us. His body lying in the tomb, his soul going down to this place of death, like a diver coming from the highest platform you could imagine, from heaven, diving, diving deep, deep, deep down, all the way. And Jesus says this shows his power. This is the sign of him being someone great. Now, we might be able to get a sense already, just from what C.S. Lewis is saying there, just from the, the fact of the resurrection, which he celebrated last week, why this shows Jesus to be so powerful. We're going to come back in a few moments, though, and think about what this means for Jesus, that he descends and comes back up again. Let's then stand and sing our next hymn before we do that. Jesus, strong and kind. It's from 1 Peter, chapter 3. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. He was put to death in the body, but made alive in the spirit. After being made alive, he went and made proclamation to the imprisoned spirits, to those who were disobedient long ago when God waited patiently in the days of Noah while the ark was being built. In it only a few people, eight in all, were saved through water. And this water symbolizes baptism that now saves you also. Not the removal of dirt from the body, but the pledge of a clear conscience towards God. It saves you by the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at God's right hand with angels, authorities, and powers in submission to him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So what does Jesus' descent? He descended to the dead for his body to be lying in the tomb, for his soul to go to the place of death. What does that mean, and how does it show Jesus' power? Like he says, it is. this is a sign. As Jesus will go to the, the heart of the earth, he says, and that'll be a sign to us all with his resurrection that he is someone powerful. Well, I think there are two things that this means. The first is that Jesus 
really experiences death. Jesus is our hero, and he's the one who does things that we could never do. That's what Peter is talking about at the start of that passage. Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. Jesus does something that we could never do, dies the full, pays the full price for all of our sins to bring us to God. But as the way that he does that, at the same time as doing what we could never do, he also experiences what every single human being will go through. His body is laid in the ground and his soul goes to the place of death. Death is a scary thing for us all. It's not something that we talk about very much today. Perhaps you might have known someone, a a granny or grandpa, maybe a great granny or grandpa who's died. And if you've ever been to a funeral, it's a very sad moment. Increasingly today, I find people don't want funerals to be sad because they don't want to confront the, the scariness of death. And we can understand that, can't we? I quoted Hamlet last week in one of his speeches He calls death the undiscovered country. Because it's a place where no one that we know, apart from one person, of course, who will come to, has gone there and come back to tell us what what it's like. So we're all left in the dark. But the message of Easter Saturday, Holy Saturday, now I've said it again, The message of this day is that Jesus really has gone there. And at least for this one day, he was laid in the ground and his soul went to the place of of the dead and we had to wait. Someone has gone and experienced death completely. At funerals, when I get to the point, either at the crematorium where the body's going to be cremated, or at the gravesite, where the, 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 the grave is dug and the, the, the coffin is lowered to the ground. There are some words that I say as that moment of the body being lowered into the ground. We say, we have entrusted our brother or sister and their name to God's mercy, and now we commit his or her body to the ground or to be cremated, earth to earth, ashes to ashes, dust to dust. And typically a minister will throw bits of dirt into the coffin to symbolize this is the beginning of their burial. And it's the moment, it's often the hardest moment of all, when we say goodbye to someone we love. This day, Holy Saturday, between Good Friday and Easter Easter Sunday, tells us that when we lay a body into the ground, our Savior has done the same thing. He has gone before us. He's gone before our loved ones. He has experienced death completely. And for us who see our loved ones be buried, and we're we're left grieved that we don't see them again, and we're left waiting, the disciples were waiting on that Saturday when all was silent, and they were left without their friends. Jesus experiences, completely experiences death. But at the same time, this this Saturday tells us that Jesus declares victory over death. And that's what Peter is really talking about in chapter 3. It's on page 1219 in the Bibles. It's a strange passage and quite complicated. There's lots of other things going on. But the big thing that he, he wants to tell his readers is that Jesus, when he died, there was a point where he started to come back up again. There was a turning point where he started to declare his victory, even over that realm of the dead. Now, you think about it, even if even if you say, the place where everyone who's died is gone, that's going to be a very, very scary place, isn't it? You can't help thinking that would be a dark and mysterious place, which we don't understand fully. But Peter says that Jesus, as part of his coming up again, declares his victory over that scariest place you can think of, the place of the dead. That's what Peter's talking about where he says, after being made alive, or probably better, 
made alive in the spirit, in which also he went and made proclamation to the imprisoned spirits, to those who were disobedient long ago when God waited patiently in the days of Noah. To people in the past who had died and in rebellion against God and thought, ha ha, we've defeated him now, but are actually in prison. Jesus goes and declares, he is the Lord over all of creation. Heaven, earth, under the earth. The message of Easter, if you like, starts with him declaring at the lowest place of all, I am the victor of death. I have defeated even the, the scariest things you can think of. So Holy Saturday is like the moment where Jesus going down turns to his going up again. I was thinking of a way to sort of illustrate this. When I was uh, 16 years old, I went on a rugby tour to New Zealand. And one of the things we got to do was to go bungee jumping. Now, this was in, I think it was 2003 or something like that. So none of us had, like, cameras and smartphones. And they couldn't, we, you could sort of get a picture, an actual picture of your bungee jump or a video on a, on a cassette get made for you. But none of us did that. So I haven't got any evidence that I did this bungee jump. But I, t I'm, I promise you I did. And I found a video just this morning of someone who did the bungee jump themselves. And this is them. Now, the thing is, I, I, they, they wrote a blog about it and said that they were really, really confident. But when it came to it, they were so terrified that they just fell off and did that with their hands. Now, we were a team of rugby players. But I can tell you that a lot of us did the same thing. We were so brave and confident before we did this bungee jump here. But when it came to it, we were just like him. And we were trying to sort of flap our arms or something like that. And then we fell to the ground and came back up again. It was a terrifying, amazing experience. But here's the bit that I wanted to just uh, notice for a second. There is a point when you're bungee jumping, when the descent stops and you start to come back up again. And it's a very strange moment. Because people often think, is that really sort of, does it feel like a sort of a terrible sort of jerk up as, the, as you go from down to up again? But it isn't because of the bungee rope. You sort of slow down, slow down. And I, I remember a moment where it felt like it lasted forever, where you're just sort of hanging in midair, about to start going back up again. It's the strangest experience. I, I actually, a few of us, touched the water with our heads. We went into the water, and you're sort of stuck there underwater. And again, it feels like forever before you start going back up again. And it's the strangest, most bizarre experience. If you like, Easter Saturday, Holy Saturday, is this moment where Jesus goes down and just starts to come back up again. He goes down to defeat death. So he experiences it, and it looks like death has got, it, got hold of him, like he's been plunged into the water. But just at this moment, he starts to come back up. And he starts to declare his victory over all the scary things, starting at the very, very bottom. Now, the rest of the, the reading in 1 Peter 3, it gets even stranger because Peter brings in baptism. But actually, thinking about all this water maybe helps us understand it. Because just as Jesus went down, 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 like that diver to the depths of the earth, then to come back up again in victory... So we can be part of that victory as we are baptized. That's what I think Peter's talking about. This water in verse 21 symbolizes baptism that now saves you also. Not the removal of dirt from the body, but the pledge of a clear conscience towards God. Jesus' baptism, our baptism, when we, whenever it happens, is like we're dipped into the water. We're dipped to the bottom like Jesus is. But then we join him on the way back up which is where Peter goes to. It saves you by the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at God's right hand with angels, authorities, and powers in submission to him. So I told you that at funerals I read at that moment when someone is lowered into the ground, their body lowered into the ground, earth to earth, ashes to ashes, dust to dust. But it doesn't stop there because it goes on. In sure and certain hope, of the resurrection to eternal life through our Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our frail bodies that they may be conformed to his glorious body, who died, was buried, and rose again for us. We lay bodies into the ground or we give them over to be cremated, 
And it's a sad and terrible moment because we won't see our loved ones for a while. But in Jesus Christ, because he went down and came back up again, because he rose and ascended, we know that that's not the end of the story. I couldn't remember the name of the funeral director, so I feel a bit bad now giving you a different corporate logo. But I'm sure you know this is Nike. Now, do you know what Nike stands for, any of you? I'll tell you, it's the goddess Victory. Now, I think that really helps you. The goddess Victory is called Nike, the Greek goddess Victory. And I think the Nike logo can help us understand the shape of Jesus' life and the shape of ours as well. So don't think of this as the Nike logo anymore. Think of this as the victory tick. Because what Jesus does is he goes down and he comes back up again. And what he promises for every single person who trusts in him is that they will experience victory. But it's victory that looks like going down and then coming back up again. So every one of us, unless Jesus returns before this, we, our bodies one day will be laid into the ground and it will be going down. But the resurrection of Jesus, and in fact, this day, Holy Saturday tells us, not only Jesus experienced death, but he defeated it. So one day we will come out again, and we'll follow him on the way up. And in every situation in our life, actually, the way of following Jesus, as we thought about before Easter, is the way of the cross. And the way of the cross is to go down, to come back up again. So in all of your relationships, the invitation Jesus has for you is to lay down your lives. Remember, we saw that before Easter. Give your lives, serve others in the sure and certain hope that Jesus will bring you back up again. That's the shape of the Christian life. It's the shape of Jesus' life. These three days, Good Friday, Holy Saturday, Easter Sunday, Jesus experienced death. Jesus defeated death. If this is true, then we have a saviour like no one else who we can trust in life and in death. I'm going to lead us in prayer before Lorelai comes and leads us in our prayers of intercession. Let's spend a few moments in silence and then I'll pray for us. Lord God, we thank you for this day, Holy Saturday, Thank you for its message of Jesus Christ being laid in the tomb, of experiencing death, of descending to the place of the dead, and of rising victorious again. Lord, we pray that you would help us to understand the enormity of the Easter message, that Jesus is Lord over everything scary, over all of creation, heaven, earth, under the earth. Lord, help us to appreciate, maybe for the first time, maybe for the thousandth time, the amazing victory that Jesus won. And help us in each of our lives to lay down our lives, to give ourselves, trusting you to raise us up again. We ask in Jesus' name and for his glory. Amen. Let's continue in prayer. Thank you very much, Lorraine.